Okay, so let's go. Hello and welcome everyone to this uh, InOL session on uh, InOL practitioners under the spotlight. I am delighted to be able to introduce today Gemma Santos Hermosa from the University of Barcelona in Spain. Um, and she is a long-term practitioner of open education. Um, she's a doctor in information science and communication and her doctoral thesis, thesis discussed the development and reuse of open educational resources in higher education. She currently works as a full-time lecturer at the University of Barcelona um, and chairs the Empower Knowledge Resources Expert Group um, within the EADTU University Network and coordinates the Open Educational Resources Action within the Repositories Working Group of REBIUN, which is the Spanish network, network of university libraries. So, Gemma, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Marta, for your kind presentation. And um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation to Paola, Agatha, Marta, well, all the organizers of this uh, Spotlight um, event. Thank you. And uh, well, I will share the presentation right now. Uh, you can tell me if it's okay, if you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Uh Perfect, so we start and of course you can ask questions when, whenever you, you need or if you are curious about something. I left some time at the end, but you can um, do it uh, during the presentation if you, you want, okay? Well, I hope that you, you like it and you are interested. So, well, I will explain you a little bit my road towards open education and OERs. And um, I think I thought about four topics, a little bit about my background, although uh, Marta has introduced me. And then I will share with you some open education and OER projects and also publications. Some lessons uh, learned, because as I was telling before, we are always uh, learning and this is a non-working progress for all of us. And then some further steps that I think that we can do and you can help me uh, to, to give us uh, like more proposals and questions, of course. So background, um, I've been a librarian for, as you can see here, I have a double role as a librarian and also as a teacher right now. I, I've been librarian for um, 15 years and I've been working in different uh, university libraries. Uh, first, I started in a hospital, in a big hospital here in, in Spain, as a support research librarian. And, and then I was working uh, in the Universitat Oberta de Catalunya, Open University of Catalonia, for all, almost my entire professional life. I was uh, um, working in the teaching and learning and research support teams. And I was also responsible for the research training uh, plan for students and researchers. And finally, I always was, uh, I was coordinating the open knowledge policy. As a teacher, I'm younger. I've been a teacher for seven, eight years. And right now, from this year, I'm a full-time professor at the University of Barcelona. I was also teaching in other universities, as you can see here. Okay, background, um, but more related with open education and OERs. I can say that I, I started in 2010. I think it was my first uh, kiss with open education and Monique uh, told us, uh, explained us in the, in the previous event uh, because it, it was when I chose my PhD topic and I was like very curious about uh, OER. So it was my first contact with this topic. Then I, I, I did uh, two predoctoral studies um, in US, in Wisconsin Medicine Library, and also in the Open University UK. And I was uh, working, collaborating with some OER projects there. I will explain to one of them later. Then I was um, in, in well, I was um, involved in some national research and innovation projects here in Spain. 
about open access first, then open science, and now open education, because this um, little by little is introducing uh, um, this new movement in, in open access um, environment. Then I, uh, well, I, I think that this is not very important because Martha told us before that I'm uh, trying to, um, to work this uh, topic also in the review in this Spanish university library um, consortium. Uh, well, one milestone for, for me, and I was a really happy day when I finally finished my doctoral thesis that was about use and development of open educational resources in higher education uh, teaching. And you can you can access if you want in this um, in this handle. Uh, I I can say that it's in Catalan. So, but there is some apps that in English. And but well, there are a lot of graphics that you can see as well if you are curious. And it was also the date when I become a member of this uh, Inoel Spark Develop um, Network. I'm very proud of this. And uh, well, I now I will um, share some projects with you. I will explain a little bit these uh, projects that you can see on the screen. I know that this is a lot of information, so I will try to go quick. And if you need like, more details, you will have all the links and all the reference in the presentation, okay? So the first one, Oriole project. It was a project uh, based on EIT, the Institute of um, Learning, in, in the Open University UK. And I was working together with, the, with Chris Peckler, professor in there. She was the director of the SCOP project and the manager of this project, Open Resources, Influence of Learners and Educators, Oriole. Now Chris is uh, retired. She, she's uh, dedicating her, her time in, in cross, uh, man, cross uh, uh, well, with her hands, she's working with her hands, but she has been, um, well, she's an expert of open education. So if you have uh, some time, you can read something about her, it will be good. Well, so in this project, Oriole, the objectives were in investigating the use, reuse, and the dissemination of open resources in learning and teaching. Uh, how? We did a survey. Well, um, uh, the Oriole survey in 2013 that was um, available in English and also Spanish because we wanted to, to spread all the survey in Spain and also Latin American countries and in all Europe. And it was very successful, I think, uh, because uh, we got a lot of information. I can um, share some results with you here. For example, we got uh, 2,041 responses. The main respondents were teachers, and our main objectives uh, were these three. The first ones, uh, the first one was to know the difference if there were difference between teachers um, that were working in projects funded uh, with requirements for share and reuse OERs, or uh, there weren't difference with the, the other users that didn't have these uh, funded projects because in this um, in this time in UK there was the joint the, the GISC sorry that was funding a lot of OER projects so there was a lot of the reuse and sharing and disseminating but we didn't know if it was because of this requirement and these funding projects. So well, finally, we were doing this study, and we our conclusion is it was that there were different significant uh, differences, and in this moment, the attitudes of um, to that um, play a role in the decision of uh, share resources between teachers uh, were more altruistic than um, for recognitions or awards. I, I'm not sure right now. Right now, I, I think that the situation has changed, but in that moment, the reasons for share and reuse were more altruistic. Mm -hmm. And then we were also asking about the roles of repositories, and they told us that um, they were good and they were influenced for sharing resources, but not that much for using resources. resources. And we, uh, they also informed us that uh, the community uh, of practice um, 
were really, really useful uh, to be incorporate to incorporate uh, repositories into education. So this is a good tip for us because now we are trying to adapt and to implement the OER recommendations in teaching and learning. So they told us that the community of practice were interested to do that. If you are curious about like more results, uh, we um, publish an article. So you have here the reference, so you can go through. Well, now I will I present you um, another kind of output, a little bit different. This is the kit of Rea. This is an OER toolkit that we were working together um, in review in this Spanish uh, network of university libraries. And it's an OER toolkit for teachers and librarians. And it has some particularities that we are like very proud of them. Because for example, is is an is an example of an uh, OER, is an OER in itself. Um, is an OER about OERs, about how to create, use, reuse, share, and implement OER in teaching. Is uh, shared with an open license with a Creative Commons. Is an example also of co-creation, I, uh, as I explained you before. Is an example of reuse because this is not new. We did an adaptation into Spanish language and into Spanish context from other OER toolkits from the college libraries uh, of Ontario. So we adapt this original um, OER with the same licenses. And we are also al aligned um, with the OER recommendations because we think that is an example of inclusive and multilingual resources because it's in Spanish, as I told you. Um, you can you have the link uh, behind the, the screen shot, so you will, you will can, you can access if you want to know a little bit more. I think I, I mentioned this in some uh, in OER meeting, but I don't remember now if you were there or. Well, it's, it's a nice initiative, you know, it was successful. A lot of teachers and were asking us about this um, toolkit and well, we are happy to, to have it. What else? I always, I always, um, I was also involved, involved in our repositories of OER projects in order to have an overview of the current state of OER repositories in higher education internationally. So, because I wanted to analyze um, if they were prepared, uh, if these repositories were prepared for the specific educational needs of um, users, and also if these repositories provide uh, reuse options or options drivers for letting reuse of the resources uh, deposited. So, um, uh, we established in this study a series of um, indicators that you can see here in the screen. For example, if um, they have open formats, if they have licenses, open licenses, um, if the learning goals were present in the metadata of these uh, OERs, uh, users community, well, all these kind of um, uh, indicators that you have here in, in the screen. And the population was 110 repositories of educational resources that we got from different international repositories directories, as you can see in the screen. I share with you some results. As you can see here, we tried to do a classification of these uh, 110 um, repositories of OERs according to the incidence of the reuse and educational indicators. And we um, build this kind of pyramid. Um, I will explain you a little bit from bottom to top. Um, for example, the, the bulk of uh, repositories, the, the most amount of repositories is um, in the low level, as you can see, 60% of repositories that um, um, accomplish like one of to four indicators. For example, they are they have open access licenses and they have also options for social networks. But just that, I mean, they don't have like more um, drivers for reuse and educational purpose. Then we go to the medium level, 
that has the, the, the 25% of repositories that um, meet these uh, five or six um, indicators. For example, they have some intention of reuse in their um, strategies or in their missions or in some documents that we found in these uh, repositories, even in the open access uh, policy as well. Uh, but they don't have um, that much educational data. The most of them are with Dublin Core, not enriched with this kind of the metadata, no specific for education. Then we go, to, uh, we go, we go up to the high um, level of repositories. Uh, Eight percent of them meet seven or, or eight indicators. In, the, in this case, we have like more use of um, metadata for educational purpose, like uh, LOM, for example, and other kind of standards. They uh, pay attention to ensure quality standards also of the education, uh, le the learning materials that are deposited. And they also pay attention to the granularity of the objects. And finally, at the top of the, this pyramid, we have um, uh, the top ROER, the top uh, repository of, of education, which is 3% uh, just, and they meet the most of the indicators. Um, the characteristic that I can say is that they are created like more specifically to share OERs. They are not hybrids. They don't have research um, um, objects, for example. <clears throat> So as you can see, there are few of them of these uh, 100 of 10 repositories. This is the situation in 2018. Uh, if you want, like, you are curious also, you, have, you need like more information, more resource, you can check also this publication in the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning. Okay, how is it? Uh, it's okay, uh, I continue. It's, uh, it's boring, it's a lot of information. Can you tell me like some feedback? <laughs> it's a lot of information, but go ahead. I, I think we have, we still have a bit of time. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, so another um, output of these uh, openness projects is the work open knowledge policy. Uh, from this university. And here I can tell you that the, the key was the collaboration between the library and the vice rectorate of globalization and communication. It was the key, this um, kind of uh, alliance between, between a, a stakeholder, decision making state, uh, stakeholder, and also the library. Um, so in this library, um, in this uh, sorry um, policy that was approved uh, recently in 2020, um, the main characteristic is that it's not just an OER or an open education policy. It's not an standalone policy, but it's an open knowledge policy. So you can find everything, all kind of knowledge, data, open data, open publications, OER, and also um, open innovation. Uh, citizen science, so it's a very global policy that was uh, created in the university. And some anecdotes that I can tell you about this policy is that it wasn't, uh, um, it was difficult to create it. It was uh, not, not um, easy, it was not a, an easy way, and it, it was uh, long also, and uh, there was a uh, process, a particip participative process, a collaborative uh, process uh, among the academia, between all the academics. So we have meetings with all of them, with different disciplines in order to meet all the needs and all the uh, concerns of all the faculty. And also we were speaking with uh, technicians and with um, pedagogues and institutional management uh, units at the university. So as you can see, it was like a very long way and a lot of collaboration between, between different units. But finally, the, the, the result was good and we have this policy right now. You can also have a look 
uh, there is the handle if you want to go in. More things. Um, another study about the OERs in the universities of um, Spanish universities. That was the reason that uh, Paola invited me to, uh, to share with you all these results because I share these results in, in LIVER in the, this annual conference of libraries, research libraries, and also in the OER domains. I'm not sure if you were there. Maybe you were participating and you, um, you know about this project of OERs in university libraries, in, in the university. Um, Spanish universities. So, well, here we were interested in to know the, um, the current situation there. So one of the objectives was to know uh, where these OER were published, if they were published in repositories, or if they were also in open courseware or in the campus, where were they? And we discovered <clears throat> discover that they were duplicated. They were around all these platforms and they were not interconnected. So for example, there were some internal tools, platforms, the virtual campus, we could find them, uh, the 80% of the resources, the OERs were there in these learning uh, management systems. They were also in the, fortunately, uh, in the institutional repositories, and some of them were also in the open courseware. As for the external platforms, they were shared in different channels, for, for example, in uh, YouTube, SlideShare, and all these kind of um, channels. And they were also in the MOOCs uh, platforms. In the case of Spain, the most of, all of, uh, of our MOOCs and OER are in MediaDAX and OpenCourseWare. Um, we were also, um, we wanted to know the impact of um, open educational policies and incentives uh, for creators of OERs. Here uh, you, you have some graphics and you can see that the most of the open policies are research oriented. They don't include OER recommendation. Most of them, there are some of them that yes, they haven't. They don't influence that much in the creation of OERs. On the contrary, uh, we found that um, all the strategies to boost the OER are like more connected with institutional actions, um, as for example, this uh, open access, open knowledge plan that I comment to you about uh, in my early uh, university. And um, there, there are not that much incentives uh, for the authors. They are rare, they are weird, but some of these strategies have into, into account these, um, these incentives. Mm. Okay, here there are a lot of data. I don't want to, um, that you are like um, too overwhelming. You can have a look of all of them that here we try to know uh, how this, o this OER were in the teaching collections in the institutional repositories. Um, we discover that, for, for example, that from, uh, 76 repositories, institutional repositories that we have in Spain that you can find in this, repo in this directory, 45 of them have teaching collections, okay? It's not a, a bad amount, okay? More than the half of them. And um, there are different volumes. Some universities uh, have a lot of um, OERs in their collections. Most of them are um, essays from students, and also some innovation projects. Uh, there are some also um, audiovisual uh, materials, as you can see these in these uh, graphics. Um, but uh, although um, the volume is increasing, there is like some need also for more institutional promotion. We discover this also in this study. Um, we discover also that um, there is a widespread use of Creative Commons, which is a good new, but they were not uh, that much open. They were not prepared for reuse of open educational resources. Okay. And there were the different deposit patterns uh, from different libraries, and they were not aware of how created OERs in these libraries. Okay. 
Mm. Okay, yeah, I think that I will go ahead. Here you can find the presentations in these two conferences, and also you have the link to access to the um, publication. Some European projects that I've been participating, for example, Chris um, is um, about digital competencies of students uh, in different universities from Europe. And we were trying to introduce also the OERs here and the open educational practices. Um, we were participating in some focus group and some interviews with teachers in order to know if they were collaborating to create these um, materials, uh, how they were working with the students, if they uh, had some peer review um, pedagogy, pedagogies with, the, with their students or not. So all these questions were um, worked in these projects. And uh, you have also a publication that you can access. Um, and the other project, is the Chris is an ongoing project because it, it has just started this year and it will finish hopefully in 2023. Uh, the main coordinator is the University of Osijek and right now we are just starting as, as I told you but we are working also in order to know if um, during this crisis, crisis situation during the pandemic there were uh, use of uh, open educational resources, open or not just, can, or, or, um, not open, maybe digital resources, uh, how the students and, teach, and teachers were dealing with this uh, pandemic crisis in, in the higher education institutions. <clears throat> And finally, other projects I'm finishing that came into my mind when I was doing this PowerPoint and that are like maybe like more closer to libraries. Uh, for example, we were creating a wiki marathon. Uh, it was a collaboration between the library of the University of Barcelona and also, and also the Department of Information Science. It was very successful. It was with the students that they were creating a different entrance different posts in the Wikipedia for open access and open science and also some subjects rela related with uh, their studies, their studies at the university. Here you have the link as well. Um, another initiative was uh, the open science microbook. I know that this open science is not OERs, but um, all these uh, micro MOOCs were recorded and they were classified in different learning um, uh, pindles so they can consider, we can consider them also as OER, as open content uh, shared by the librarian community to the researchers, teachers, and other stakeholders. It was also a working, a collaborative work of the consortia of university libraries and other partners international uh, partners also, for example, Spark Europe was also working on there. And um, uh, the last uh, example is the OER transfer that we did from one institutional repository, one in Valencia, where Paola is going right now, Rionet to Merlot. You know that Merlot is, the, is a specific educational uh, is, um, repository. So we were doing this transfer of educational metadata from this uh, repository to Merlot. And it was also a very long uh, wait, but finally we did it. So all these kind of things we can do from libraries. Okay, finally, some lessons uh, learned during this um, background and this long way um, of OERs. Mm, collaboration, I think that is a key. We should collaborate between us internationally, nationally, and also between in the institution, between different disciplinary and different roles and different units at the institutions. Uh, we have to, to collaborate and work with persistence and perseverance because it's hard, but not too much stubborn because you know, this is, 
we have to be flexible, okay? We know that this is very beneficial for teachers, but we have to be a little bit empathic, to have empathy with them and not to be like too much pressure, okay? Think outside the box, this is important, go beyond the traditional ways of working, the traditional and the, accept the acceptance uh, of the um, faculty because sometimes they are afraid uh, to go and to share these uh, teaching materials. So we have to convince them to do some advocacy for open education. And finally, so I mean the deep end, we have to take risk. Otherwise we are not going to advance. We have to do it in all uh, situations in our life. For example, as now you are here in this network. And of course we have some difficulties. Sometimes we are busy. We are not, we don't speak English that much. Well, I, for example, my English not, is not so, so good, but we have to take risks in our lives and also in the open education field. Because um, we, if we believe in what we are promoting, they will join us. So this is well what I have learned. And right now, further steps, you can help me. So for example, in my case, to apply the theory of this research that I've been doing to the practice. Now I have the opportunity as a teacher to apply of all of this expertise and knowledge and to create OERs, to convince other colleagues that uh, this is good, uh, to apply some open educational practices to my teaching. Um, other thing uh, that I'm collaborating also with you in the Spark Open Education uh, Survey, that it will be very beneficial to know um, how libraries are behaving to participate in open educational projects and also networks and some others. You have some other proposals or there are further steps that we can follow. Now is your turn. So thank you very much for your patience. If you have uh, some questions or if you want to share some proposals, they are welcome. And you have here my contact details in case that you need to contact me. Thank you very much. Gemma, that was absolutely fascinating. And I am sure that many of us recognize a lot of the themes that you are discovering via your research. So does anyone have questions for Gemma to answer about any of her projects or any thoughts that you've had? I know I have several, but I want to give you guys the opportunity first. Anyone? Vanessa. So I was so thank you so much, Gemma. You've just done so much on many different levels on looking at policy, looking at uh, practice, particularly looking at discovery. So, so many important areas. Um, so firstly, I was curious, so all these projects, uh, where did the funding come from and who initiated those projects? So were they, so I think they were national, many of them were national. So is there an open, uh, open education national funding program or in what kind of context where how did these come about yeah. did you did you also talk to people to get some extra money how how yeah i would be really uh, curious thank you okay thank you vanessa thank you for also for attending um yeah you are right some of them are national research and innovation projects from the Ministry of Education and also from the Ministry of uh, Universities and Innovation. They weren't mm, targeted to open education directly. They were like more open science, but uh, there is like a kind of current or line in open science um, about open education. So I was trying to mm, point out this uh, other um, uh, cell or this other component of uh, the open access uh, environment or okay, um, ecosystem. And I was uh, starting with other partners, of course, this line of research based on open education. This is one. 
The other one, the first that I share with you, the Oriole, it was a funded project from GISC in UK. So in this case was from the UK government. Um, the other projects, there was another one that I shared, I didn't share with you because I didn't want it to, to be so long, that was in the Wisconsin University. It was an institutional uh, project. So the institution uh, put some money in the repository and create an open educational line also. And what else? And some of them are without funding. For example, the, the wiki projects were because we were engaged, teachers and librarians, we wanted to do something with uh, students and it was like more um, altruistic. And I told you before, uh, there was not funding. And for the micro MOOC, I don't remember, I think that there was some funding just a little bit from the institution, from the CESUC, which is a consortium of Catalan universities. There was some funding there, but the rest was also because of the librarians, the enthusiasm of the librarians, and they were working even um, in during the, the free time. I mean, because they really uh, engaged, they were engaged in this project. So yeah, some of them are funded and some of them no. Well, Gemma, what I'm really curious about is, because I know sometimes, especially when you're working as a librarian, you're so caught up with your day-to-day -day activities that it's hard to get into the business of being involved in funded projects where you have to put in funding applications and all those kinds of things. So how did you go about that? Yeah, it's, it's true. I have to say here that as I have, the other role also as a, as a PhD student, and I was in collaborating with um, academics, and I was in a research group, in a research center. It was easier for me because I was like very close to academics and to funding projects and all this. But as a librarian, I, I also can say that there are some funding projects or some collaborations that uh, we we can be aware of them because of the, these networks that I mentioned before. If we are collaborating with other librarians, we can uh, found out um, this kind of projects or networks or, or funding um, that is available there. And also mm, the European projects are not, are ju not just for uh, researchers. There are some Erasmus projects the Chris was an Erasmus project, and it's also for librarians. I mean that there are libraries, there are not just academics involved in this uh, project. So they, there are different kind of uh, projects that are not just for academics, not for research, also for librarians, for libraries. You, you have to be aware and be contact, networks, projects, mm, open your eyes. <laughs> So it sounds like um, one of the keys for what you're saying is is the the collaboration, the the being open to collaborating with whoever locally and internationally. Um, but I also have a, another question. You said that the development of that open education policy or that open science policy in in the open university in Catalonia was really difficult. So tell us a little bit more about that because I think a lot of us are interested in OER because we are librarians, we have very practical minds and we like the, you know, the that aspect of things. But then there's the other one, the the kind of the promoting and championing and all of that. And that's a little bit more daunting. So how do how did you go about that? Yeah, yes, you are right. Well, in this case, we were lucky. Our library was lucky because we were collaborating very closely with the vice rectorate of globalization. So we have someone strong there. Um, I mean, to collaborate, but. Um, here, I think that the, the key was, as I told you before, the collaboration between different units, because if you want to do a, a global policy for all, 
you must consider all the opinions. Of course. Because if you are doing a, a policy from top, top down, um, maybe faculty or librarians or educational partners are not very convinced. So if they participate in the process as we did, we did a, an open collaborative and participation pros, process during the open access week in October, 2020. So we were sharing different platforms uh, to get some feedback from different stakeholders. And we tried to, to implement them in the policy. And I think this, this was good, but also long and also difficult because you, you, you have to, to deal with different opinions and different uh, interests, different roles at the university. It's good and, and bad at the same time. But I think that is the way to do it if you want to that this policy is accepted by the by the stakeholders at the university. So in I don't know if I'm answering your question, but here you, you have to be patient, patient and you have to be strategic, try right? to, to get some alliance and, and also to collaborate with different units. Um, I don't know what to say about the our alliance with the um, vice rectorate. I think that we initiated with the open access week. I think it was with the micro MOOC and all this. Mm -hmm. We were doing some noise. I mean, we were um, uh, at Twitter and we were promoting some um, projects from the library, and they were curious of our work. They were um, ah contacting us, you know, it was like this uh, as well. So if you are doing some noise, if you are doing things, uh, they will come to you also. They will be interested in, in your what you are doing. This is a way, a, a strategy, for example. Of course, you can also uh, pick the door and go there. And But if you have some evidence, if you have something to share, some realistic world, they will pay attention and they will be open to hire you more than if you don't have it. So theory is very, yeah, practice outputs. It sounds also like you had a strong mandate from your own library management or whatever to go ahead and do this. Yeah, it was one of the strategic uh, lines in the library and also in the, at the university because we have this strategic plan with a line for openness. So yeah, I, I have to say that in this case, it helps, of course, it helps a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone has any more questions from Gemma? Also proposals, it would be nice also to know if you have like other proposals, other initiatives, interesting initiatives. I'm sure you have. I think many of us are only starting on our journeys. Oh, not all of us, because I can see Gabby there. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah. Well, and I was just uh, um, starting to say, I, I do not have uh, anything to add now because it, it would be too much. It would be a, a discussion again. Uh, but I like the way you put it in your presentation. So it helped me to uh, reorder my thoughts again. And uh, I, I really want uh, to make use of the links in the presentation you, uh, you used. Uh, because we are in, well, we have similar projects going on, uh, both locally in the institution as uh, on a national level. And it, it's good to see that we have similarities and that we can learn from what you already uh, encountered. And, uh, and there will be a moment that we can share our uh, uh, experiences as well. It was, uh, yeah, it, it, um, you, you framed it very nice. That, that's good to, uh, to copy. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. A lot of food for thought. Yeah, yeah. Thank Kema, you. Thank I, I have another question about another of your projects, the one where you looked at repositories. And I'm asking about this because one of the things that I'm encountering within my own university is that there are several pockets of people doing things and putting them into their virtual learning environments and not even though they are applying Creative Commons um, licenses and everything else, um, they don't have anywhere to put this stuff. 
So I'm curious to see what you found. I was really curious about that project. And Monique, I'm seeing that you have your hand up, so I'll, I'll get back to you in a minute. Um, but that, you know, that sense of what are the repositories doing and how many of them are actually geared towards that sharing and reuse, I thought that was very interesting. Do you mm -hmm. have anything else to add to that? Um, well, in my experience, uh, like more in institutional repositories, uh, for example, here in Spain, we have these collections, but I, I didn't found them in other countries in Europe, for example. So I think that is a good opportunity if the, the institution has a repository to open a collection for sharing also uh, teaching materials and learning materials also from students. So it's something that we can do from institutions. Of course, that are maybe, but no, maybe they are better prepared those repositories uh, specifically created for OERs. They have like more metadata, more standards, more usability as you could see before, but at least if the institutional repository, you have a collection, is a way to start and you avoid to have all these interesting OERs um, empty in the learning management systems or the campus because when they um, finish the subject or the courses, uh, they are gone. All these uh, OERs are, are gone. So yeah. um, if, we want, if we want to preserve and share them, uh, we can um, encourage uh, teachers to share them also in the repository, in the one that we have available. If it's an uh, OER repository, uh, fantastic. Uh, if it's an institutional or also if it's a, I don't know, other kind of platform as well. So I will say this to try and to- And of course, it's an opportunity for libraries to play a really good role. Of course, Monique, yeah. Monique, you had your hand up. What did you want to ask? Okay, yes. Yes. Thank you, uh, Gemma, for uh, your presentation. Um, you're so enthusiastic. <laughs> I get inspired by it. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> and all your projects, wow. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the incentives uh, we can uh, provide for the, for the teachers to share their material and to reuse uh, material. Do you have plans uh, for a follow-up of your article on uh, how the altruism of uh, the, the, the teachers um, shift to um, recognition and awards. I, I'm very curious about that. Where, where does the altruism um, stop and, 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 and changes into uh, recognition or awards? And what can we libraries do about that? Because, you know, so, some of the, of the researchers slash teachers uh, want rewards or recognition, not just, they're not altruistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they are al altruistic, but, but not all of them. Yeah, um, yeah. you're right, uh, Monique, thank you. Um, yeah, from li libraries, we can do something. It's true that uh, if in the institution is very implied and they have some, um, uh, incentives for academics, it will be easier. But uh, from the library, we can create some something. For example, now we were creating these open educational championships from the libraries, not from Spark. So some kind of uh, recognition, recognition, some kind of awards. For example, um, that um, these OERs that are shared in the repository um, have a special um collection show in twitter during one week or and now i'm remember rem remembering some uh there was some collection a special collection in our repository of oers that um have a lot of uh, uses a lot of downloads downloads and a lot of um, access and we point out uh, yeah, during the open access week uh, a kind of championship and it was good for academics because they were more sites of their articles 
and also more views of their profiles uh, in the website of the institution and these kind of things that are good for them, for example, also for research because uh, they need citations and they need recognition. It wasn't economical, it was like more, um, I don't know how to say, like more publicity, marketing, but it was also good for them because they could also um, be in contact with other experts of these uh, um, topics that we share in this uh, collection. This is one that I come to my mind and there was also some uh, government um, scholarships in the in Extremadura in uh, in our autonomy of Spain that uh, were offering some economical um, funds for teachers in primary and secondary education that share the material in a repository in a national repository. So there were some universities as well that were thinking in doing the same. Uh, in, at an institutional level. So libraries can also collaborate with this. They can also join to these teams in, yeah. in the institutional, in, in institutions, or they can propose it. For example, if they have some, I don't know, opportunity, some event or some um, uh, space to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it helps a lot now. Yeah, yeah, it helps. That. And, and also the combination of Open Access Week and uh, Open Educational Resources uh, to, to, to gain yeah. publicity for uh, this topic. I, I think that that's a strong combination. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Vanessa, you also have your hand up. So just a really quick question. So I was really inspired. Um, several times repositories have kind of come up in your story and how important they are also for our teachers to be able to find their resources again and and you also looked in on a European level to see what repositories were out there and that was I think it was 2018 wasn't it the project yeah so I would really like we have some money uh, from this Hewlett project to perhaps update that to find out more about repositories um, in Europe because I think before we join those up we need to find out also what's out there, what are the challenges? And, and, and I was also curious about what was the goal? You did talk about several times, um, you uh, inquired about how, to what extent was material being reused or mm -hmm. uh, made available for reuse? C can you remind me, I may have missed it, what was the goal of that repository project? Yes, they What were. did you want to achieve? Yes, was to, to know the um, overview of the of these repositories of open educational resources, but uh, like focus on two aspects. Mm, the reuse uh, drivers, if these repositories have some kind of options to, to let the reuse of the objects, mm -hmm. and also educational aspects, because we know that if we want that they are used, uh, um, teachers um, should find the material so metadata right. educational metadata yes. uh, education objectives uh, learning objectives uh, educational levels have to be there because if you are find, trying to find an uh, OER about i don't know um about MOOCs uh, um, in open in higher education you could do that so all these um filters filters in repositories must be advanced to let mm, yes. users to find these objects from an educational point of view and from the use point of view because maybe you find an OER that is like perfect is uh, very relevant for your subject is from higher education is from MOOCs but is shared with an open license restrict it a little bit is maybe not the most open maybe not the one that let reuse so mm -hmm. you have to contact the author to let you use this resource so all these kind of things we were very you know interested to know if repositories were prepared for letting mm, reuse and educational aspects to users mm -hmm. so if we wanted to take 
the next step to build on your work, what would you say would be really important to do? So if we wanted to do something more with these repositories and with the, this overview that you've done now, what direction do you think we should go? What should we look at? What was missing or what would we, what should we find out more to help us in the future? Yeah, I would say different things. Uh, of course, open licenses and open formats. This is one that we, uh, we need to know who are these objects there. And also metadata, educational metadata, um, other characteristics that can be useful for users. Uh, what else? This is also important in, in a project that I'm also doing now. Um, it's important to connect different platforms. So repositories are not alone in the institution. There, is, there are also the learning management uh, systems, the virtual campus. There are um, other kind of uh, wiki platforms or other kind of um, educational tool that they, 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 they must be connected, all of them. So interoperativity, not just between repositories that we are working on these librarians, but also between different platforms in an institutional level. They, they must Absolutely. speak between the, them, themselves because otherwise we are working in the same, but we are not collaborating. We are not going to in the same way. The missions are doing something Teachers are doing other things, librarians are doing other things. So yeah. we should join efforts and communicate all these platforms. This is I actually important. think interoperability is key because you have, mm. you know, IT support systems in the universities, you have all the course management systems and all of those things. And at least in my institution, I know for sure that there's an awful lot of duplication of effort because the systems are not talking to one another. So it's definitely, yeah. Gemma, mm -hmm. it, this, is, this was a really fascinating talk, um, as I knew it would be. Um, we have come to the end of the hour. I, I don't know where that time went. That was amazing. <laughs>